final topic to be addressed in this module, which must necessarily be incomplete, relates to movement. In much of the preceding work, we have um, discussed experimental and theoretical work um, largely fueled by the view of the person as a, an information processing entity. That is, most of the work that has been done in um, thinking about language and indeed about perception and to some extent about behavior has adopted a particular frame perhaps best expressed in the cognitivist or computational theory of mind. When we turn to movement now, we are going to encounter some tensions there. And most of the insights here will find expression in embodied theories of cognitive science. And as we'll see, they rarely feature in computational theories. So let's see why. You would think movement would be important to understand if you want to know what someone is doing. So recall that the development of scientific psychology in the 19th century set off with somewhat inarticulate goals, but there were two basic poles, two basic, two fundamental topics that the discipline of psychology originating, as we said, in the need to care for each other, so soteriological concerns, became obsessed with. And these were the idea of trying to understand experience, subjectivity, what things feel like, how do emotions work, are you suffering? Those are experiential questions. And behavior. Behavior is something we observe from the outside, and then we muse about why such, a, such and such a behavior happens. How did it come about? How are behaviors created, maintained, gotten rid of? And if you've ever tried to stop smoking, we'll know that that's quite difficult. Experience itself is unobservable, with a constant concern. And there, William James is our principal figure, perhaps, of reference. Behaviour, on the other hand, seems to be entirely observable. Surely this is the simplest thing to study. So that ask, leads us to ask what the relationship is between movement and behaviour. Unquestionably, we can record, document, diagram movement. We can observe movement. How is that different from behavior? Well, I'll take you back to an earlier part of this module at the opening. We said that if we observe Christopher Robin with a shovel digging a grave, a shallow grave in his back garden, we might decide that his behavior is burying his grandma who we just killed. But we could also describe the same movements in very different terms. We could say he's digging or we could say he's eluding, he's trying to evade responsibility, or we could say he's digesting, which is also going on at the same time. So here is the fundamental difference between a description couched in terms of behavior and a description based solely on observed movement. To describe something as a behavior, we must understand it in terms of purpose or goals. So a behavioural description in this respect is, poses challenges if we wish to maintain a veneer of objectivity in our work. For it is the observer who chooses to frame the movement as arising from a particular intent or goal. So movement is relatively neutral. If we merely observe movement, we haven't committed ourselves to saying who's doing what, what the animating forces are, what the influences are, what causes are. But when we cast it as behavior, we have now thrown a sort of a film of purposiveness over it. Now, psychology has, of course, a long history of studying behavior, 
One of its main businesses, we've noted the importance of the behaviorist approach. We've noticed how behavioral questions keep arising. Um, and yet, the discipline of psychology, which is based on an account in which movement is attributed to a single individuated person, seems to be very insensitive to movement. So here's an example of uh, the high-level categories of psychological science as understood by this particular website. I don't know if it has any authority. And we see there psychology is concerned with perception, categorization, memory, knowledge representation, numerical cognition, language, and thinking. There's no movement in there at all, except perhaps for the flapping of the tongue during language, which will be abstracted from as quickly as possible. That seems to me to be reasonably representative of how the discipline of psychology has been constructed. Here's a similar example from uh, the best-selling introductory textbook to cognitive psychology. And there's all the chapters. Visual perception, object recognition, attention, memory, 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 knowledge, categories. We see virtually no engagement with movement science here. Now, there is a field of movement science, often called various things. So there's a great deal of expertise in physiology, in sports science, uh, in ethology, in understanding movement. But this business of um, the difficult relationship between movement and behavior which makes the capacity for, of psychology to address movement without or beginning with an intentional construction of that movement, difficult. So if behavior is goal-directed movement, then goals must play an important part in any account of behavior. Those goals are the lens through which the observer views the behavior. And it seems that this makes behavioral interpretation difficult. It poses us with epistemological challenges in doing our science. We cannot wish goals away. Now, science is often considered to have a significant founding figure, among others, in Aristotle. And Aristotle saw goals everywhere. He thought things fell towards the earth because they wanted to be there. Things rose, movement arose in the natural world because every element of the natural world wanted to get somewhere. There was, it, they were attracted to certain states, up, down, sideways. Uh, but Aristotle went out of fashion with, the, with modern science in the 16th century and was entirely replaced. And in the physical sciences, goals are absolutely outlawed. You don't do physics by suggesting that the moon wants to revolve around the earth, for example, or that the sun wants to do something to something else. But we don't only do physics. In cognitive science, we're doing the science that considers persons in worlds. And here we can't really take goals out of the equation. We are exquisitely sensitive to goals. So here I'm going to show you just a few moving dots and then I'm going to ask you what you see. Of course, I don't know what you saw. I can only tell you what I saw. I appeared to see the suggestion of someone kicking, punching, performing various very clear goal-directed activities. Yet all that was available to me was the movement of certain white dots on a blue screen. We are sensitive to interpreting movement as goal-directed. We saw this, in fact, we saw an elaboration of this as we watched the video of triangles chasing a little dot, where we attributed 
entire psychologies to small little cartoon shapes on the screen. Here, the movement is two-dimensional, trivial, white dots, and yet we are immediately drawn to, almost compelled to interpret it in terms of goals. So, historically, the study of movement has played second fiddle to the primary concerns of the psychological sciences. So those higher cognitive functions like reasoning, planning, etc., that express rationalist concerns. And to the study of perceptual phenomena, perhaps because perception is such a mystery or such a poor term. But there has been a great deal of work done in movement science, and most of it is still unknown or ignored within the cognitivist areas of cognitive science, which represent the majority. We noted before, when we looked at theories of perception, we noted that there were representational theories that involved taking in the world and constructing a representation of it. And in such theories, perception was clearly categorically distinct from action, which was seen as output. When we looked at relational theories of perception, we observed that perception and action are fused. They're two sides of the same coin. So that when I move my head, what I see changes, and the movement of my head is part of the seeing. So that insight from relational approaches to perception should encourage us to explore movement a little bit without, uh, or with a degree of caution in adopting a purely psychological perspective or assuming that the movement we observe results from a single agent. There's lots to see here. <laughs>